My talk will be on elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, it's a lot to cover, so I'm going to have to unfortunately ask everybody to hold their questions until the end and buckle up in for a ride. All right, so before we talk about cryptography and elliptic curves and all that stuff, everybody needs to know what encryption is. One definition is on the screen. Um, basically, encryption is all about turning a message or some sort of data into a code so that you can send it across an insecure channel um, so that if it's intercepted, the person who intercepts it, we might call the man in the middle, will just see your code. They won't be able to get the message or the actual data. And the only person who can get the message is your intended recipient who can uncode or decrypt that message into its sort of meaningful form. And oftentimes, this encryption, decryption, is done through the use of a shared secret or a shared key, which begs the question, how do you get those shared keys? Um, and a long time ago, sort of in the beginning, they would actually share those keys physically. Like two parties who wanted to talk to one another would send a trusted person with the key literally like on a piece of paper to take it to the other party so they would have a shared key in a secure way. Obviously, that poses tons of logistical problems and wouldn't work for sort of the internet as we know it. Um, so it wasn't until 1977 with the birth of RSA and Diffie-Hellman. Um, specifically, what we're going to talk about today is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. Uh, we sort of have the birth of modern cryptography. Um, and so to learn about the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, this will sort of be our basis for understanding elliptic curves in a minute. Uh, but to understand Diffie-Hellman, let's just think about a very simple scenario. Um, so let's say we have two random people, Nick and Connie, um, who want to talk securely over the internet. Um, so they come up with this protocol. And the first thing that they're going to do is share an arbitrary number, G. Um, now this G is just sort of center of the internet, could have been intercepted, we don't really care. And then each of them makes up their own secret, and they share that with nobody. They don't send it at all. So we'll call that N for Nick and uh, C for Connie. The next thing they do is they take that commonly shared G, and they raise it to the power of their secret. Uh, so for Nick, that'd be G to the N, and then they create this H term. Once they have this H, they uh, exchange those H's, so they send it to the other person. So now Nick has Connie's H, and Connie has Nick's H. And then they take that value and raise it to their secret again. And they're actually going to end up with the same number, the same secret after this whole protocol. And we can see why, basically because of how multiplication and uh, exponents work. Uh, essentially, that whole process boils down to g to the cn for Nick and g to the nc for Connie. And you know, multiplication doesn't matter what order you do. So the exponents are going to be the same. So the secret's going to be the same. So they're going to get the same secret. Problem solved, right? Right. right. No. Uh, the problem is this thing right here. So G and H were exchanged over the internet. If anybody intercepted those two numbers, it would be trivial to figure out what N is. So you could get Nick's key super easily. And then once you have Nick's key, you can figure out what the shared secret is, and then the whole encryption scheme goes away. Getting, getting this N would be as easy as solving this problem. Somebody tell me what N is. Quickly, I don't have a lot of time. Well, what's, what is N equal? What number is N? Four, thank you. All right, smarty pants over here. How about now? You actually can't do it, or at least you can't do it very quickly. Uh, because of this mod, so this is the modulus operator, it sort of wraps around, and we have no idea how many times over 17 we've gone. So an analogy might be a clock. So say that I, I tell you I started an activity, and the clock face said noon. And then I ended that activity, and the clock face said 1 o'clock. And then I ask you, how many hours elapsed between these two times? You would have no idea. Because it could be one hour, or the clock could have gone all the way around. It could have been 13, or 25, or 37. So, uh, so the point is that because you have no idea how to do that like, mathematically, you just have to start guessing. And this is called the discrete log problem, and it's sort of the basis for uh, this Diffie-Hellman encryption scheme, is that it's really easy to do all this exponent stuff to create the secrets. And then because this problem is so hard to solve, it's borderline impossible to get the secrets if they're sufficiently large you know, without, knowing, without knowing N or C. Um, and what's cool is that the modulus operator doesn't actually screw up that whole exponent equivalence thing, where it doesn't matter what order the exponents are done in. So you can actually just chuck mod into those equations, and we have the exact same protocol. So we just add it to the first step, add it to the second step. Now we have shared S's again. 
but nobody can figure out what Nick or Connie's secrets are. All right. So what's the problem? This sounds perfect, right? Yeah, except for uh, the facts, you know, like that discrete log problem being hard, um, it's getting easier because of algorithms. Um, so there are algorithms, I don't have time to talk about them, but if somebody asks me at the end, they're very interesting. Um, but these algorithms make solving that discrete logarithm problem easier, which means that to be secure, keys have to be larger. Except keys also have to be smaller because we have phones and Internet of Things and smaller devices that want to be able to use encryption and send messages, but don't have as much computing power to generate keys of a sufficient size. So as you might have guessed, elliptic curves come to the rescue. And if we think about what we would want to solve this problem, we really want like the exact same thing that is just not vulnerable to those algorithms that make solving the discrete log problem easier. And that's exactly what elliptic curves give us. And elliptic curves have this really cool property that if you take two points on the elliptic curve, call them A and B, and then you draw a line through those points, that line is going to intersect the curve in at most one other place. We can see that in the top right corner. And then if you do that and you sort of uh, flip that point over, uh, why aren't you playing? Aha, uh -huh. okay. So if you go to that point and then we're going to flip it over the x-axis, essentially take the, the inverse of it, we're going to get a point C. And then once we get this point C, we just do that operation again. So then we start with C, now we have C and A. And then we find that third point right here, flip it over the x-axis. That's going to give us D. We do it again. You have A and D, go to the point. Do that operation over and over again until we get a new point. We'll call that E. So if you were to represent this in math, you just say N of A, N times A equals E, where it's not really multiplication. It's this A dot A, that operation of the two points finding the other one going over the thing. Um, and it turns out that this is very similar to the exponent problem in the sense that it's even if you have A and E, if you know the point on the curve somebody started at and the point that they ended at, uh, it's really, really, really hard to figure out what N is, how many times they did this dot operation. Um, so, and the, the other nice thing about this operation is it has that same sort of uh, order independence that the exponent has. So with Diffie-Hellman, you know, you do exponent at the end first and then C. That's the same as doing C and then N. And with the elliptic curve, if you dot N times and then dot that result C times, it's the same as going the opposite direction. So since it has this sort of order uh, property, we can actually just change the Diffie-Hellman procedure just with these elliptic curve equations. And it all works exactly the same. So instead of raising g to the exponent n, now you're just going to dot g n times. And then when you get h, you do it again. They have their shared secrets. Now, I made a big deal about the whole modulus thing, right? The fact that you had to like, take the numbers, the possible answers to the exponent problem and shrink them. Because when you mod 17, you limit the numbers between 0 and 16 or 17. Um, and so you have to do the same thing with elliptic curves. You have to you have to shrink and set the possible values. And we do that uh, by sort of making the space of the graph finite. So this doesn't look like those curves I was showing you before, but it actually is. This is sort of like a representation of all the integer points of that curve. Um, and if you don't believe me, notice that like, there's this horizontal symmetry, top and bottom, just like there was for the curve. Um, and it'll wrap around. So if we have A and B, and it goes outside the field, It'll wrap around just like the modulus does. And so we can do this dot operation on this finite field and create this discrete log problem, um, which is really kind of similar to Diffie-Hellman. Um, but the key takeaway is sort of that bottom line, that because this math isn't vulnerable to those same algorithms, it's just as hard to break a 228-bit elliptic curve key as it is to break a 2,380-bit Diffie-Hellman key. So same security, way smaller fits for a lot of our new use cases with mobile devices and everything. Of course, though, there are downsides. Um, these elliptic curves are really, really complicated, and not very many people understand or can do the math. Um, many of them are patented. And unlike you know, RSA or Diffie-Hellman, some of these sort of original uh, encryption systems, this, the elliptic curve fails without sufficient randomness. 
And so if you have a bad random number generator, uh, it kind of undermines the whole scheme. And there have actually been several attacks that use this flaw. Um, the theoretical foundation is not as secure. So with Diffie-Hellman, they actually proved that that discrete log problem is hard. Like nobody's going to be able to come up with an algorithm that nobody thought of and break it. Uh, with elliptic curves, that proof isn't there. So it's possible that some hacker genius could figure out an algorithm that nobody's thought before, thought of before, and, and break this scheme. Uh, with that being said, though, in 30 years of mathematics research, nobody's come up with an algorithm that improves on sort of the naive approach. Um, and so that's why it's so useful at the same time. And then finally, uh, you can have bad curves, and you can have systems that sort of have built-in trap doors that aren't really immediately obvious. Um, and because so many people don't understand it, they sort of have to trust other organizations to say, like, this curve is a good curve. And there's this organization called the NIST that uh, sort of sponsors these curves or approves these curves. And someone proved that one of the curves that they, they were sort of promoting could have been built with a trap door. And that same curve was also promoted by the NSA. So nobody knows if the NSA actually put that trap door in this schema, but the possibility scares some people. Even with all those downsides, because of you know, where a lot of distributed computing is going, um, we're going to see these more and more. Any questions? Brian. Uh, 